Good day, everybody. I'm Garth Manning, Wonka's CEO, and a very warm welcome to this, the sixth in a series of Wonka webinars. Mm. Today, the topic is rural issues linked to COVID-19. I think it's fair to say that rural and isolated communities suffer even more through COVID-19, as it's yet one <coughs> more of the social determinants which impact so severely on their lives. So this will be an extremely helpful and instructive session. Today's webinar will be moderated by the chair of Wonka's Working Party on Rural Practice, Professor Bruce Chater, and he has put together a truly global panel of doctors and nurses to talk about the issues. The panel will be introduced as we go along, but I especially want to welcome Professor Michael Kidd to this webinar. Of course, Michael is a past president of Wonka and now principal medical advisor and Deputy Chief Medical Officer at the Department of Health in Australia. Welcome, Michael. Most of today's session will involve a series of presentations, but there'll still be an opportunity to pose some questions to the panel, either through the chat forum on Zoom or via the Facebook live streaming, and Pratyush and Sanka will be monitoring both. Questions will be moderated as usual by our President-elect, Dr. Anastav Dahl. But first, before handing over to Bruce, I'd like to welcome our Wonka president, Dr. Donald Lee, for his opening remarks. Good day, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the sixth Wonka webinar. Next slide, please. Family doctors continue their massively increased workload as we face the COVID-19 epidemic. I'm proud of the level of support and collegiality displayed within and across our member organizations and from region to region. Family doctors all around the world are disseminating scientific advice, clinical updates, reflective messages, and professional support through their social media links and connections. The Wonka webinar is a platform for all of you to share experiences, relay information, and to keep in touch with each other regularly, like family members, urging courage, offering mutual support in these extraordinary times. Next, please. Possessing a broad range of skills, family doctors in rural practice provide comprehensive and re irreplaceable care to rural communities. Rural practitioners deal with clinical uncertainties every day, managing patients who present with unspecific signs and symptoms and often have limited resources equipment and support from other specialists. It is in part <clears throat> because of our ability to manage clinical uncertainty. Family doctors are well adapted to cope in times of acute uncertainties such as COVID-19. <clears throat> this webinar will enable rural doctors from around the world to describe how they are preparing for, protecting against and dealing with COVID-19. The session will allow sharing of initiatives, limitations and concerns, and explore how rural health systems prepare for the future in the COVID area. So now back to you, Garth. Okay, thank you, Donald. Uh, well, without further ado, I'll hand over to Professor Bruce Chater and his team. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks very much, Garth, and welcome to this webinar hosted by Rural Wonka and, and Parent Wonka. Uh, thanks to Donald Lee and President-elect Anna Stavdahl for their support in these webinars and particularly for having one focused like this on rural issues. I'm Bruce Chater, the Chair of Rural Wonka, the Wonka Working Party on Rural Practice. Uh, many of you have known me for years. Uh, you'll be wondering whether you'll be uh, whether I look slightly different. Um, yes, the beard is gone uh, as only appropriate for fitting a, uh, a proper fitting face mask. So even my beard is uh, a very minor casualty of uh, this COVID epidemic. Um, little did we realise last year that what was over the horizon uh, when we looked forward to the 17th World Rural Health Conference in Bangladesh our wonderful colleagues in Bangladesh and South Asia worked hard to develop an exciting conference, but this was overtaken by COVID-19 and its devastating effects on the community. Like many other aspects of our lives, next slide please, we had to go through uh, how to get this online um, and 
and so we had uh, uh, the issue of, uh, of COVID-19 over our head in doing that. Um, this is the first step in rolling out a virtual conference to respect what has happened to our colleagues in, in Bangladesh. And we thank very much uh, Zakur Rahman and his young and very enthusiastic team who've been working with us uh, to have this conference and now to have it virtually through this and other webinars. Next slide, please. Uh, what we're talking about tonight is, in tonight my time and many of you in different time zones, uh, is a variety of issues. Uh, there's some COVID issues uh, around the patients, obviously, who are affected by COVID, the practice, uh, how do we cope for and care for those patients, COVID care, the variability that there is with, uh, with COVID across the world, concurrent issues such as pregnancy and other, other uh, uh, concurrent conditions. Very importantly, those things that, that are displaced by COVID issues, uh, the usual care that we provide, the public health issues, the access uh, for people into those, uh, into those uh, services, and also the uh, migration issues, uh, the migration back to country, the migration from country to country. Medical education issues, how do we get a virtual uh, medical education uh, situation, a medical course, uh, uh, postgraduate uh, training. The economic issues uh, that I think all countries are now, uh, are now uh, struggling with. And the future issues, what's practice going to look like after COVID? Uh, uh, what's going to be different? Will some of the changes that have happened stay or will they, uh, will they move back to the way we were? Uh, I think most of us suspect that there will be changes, but what those will be can be hard to predict. So as a rural resident and rural doctor, I've faced, pondered and addressed many of these issues in my own practice and in my hospital. I'm so looking forward tonight to hearing the experience of others from around the world who face these in their own environment. Um, I'm having uploaded a, uh, uh, a more detailed working list of some of the issues. If, uh, if Harris can get that up onto the, uh, the chat for us, uh, hopefully there'll be a link there for that. Um, and uh, you'll be able to hopefully look at that list as a, a prompt to your questions. We've assembled a really great panel tonight uh, from around the world to touch on all these issues. Uh, followed by a chance for you to answer some, uh, sorry, to ask some questions and for our panel to answer those questions. We've got two ways that that will happen. Uh, there'll be a Zoom chat and a live feed on Facebook. And we have Sanka, Radana Kumara and Pratush Kumar monitoring and feeding these to Anna Stavdal, who will pose the questions to our panel. I'll just introduce the panel now to you and then we'll very give very brief introductions between the various presentations. We've got Michael Kidd who's already been introduced to not only as a former president of Wonka but a deputy chief medical officer in Australia leading policy interventions. Desmond Waugh uh, featured in the New York Times recently and had six patients on ventilators in the USA. John Wynne Jones, our former chair, has been keeping on a finger on the pulse around the world and sharing our humanity via rural health wonka, Mr. Delaney. Um, Zakur Rahman has seen the toll in his local community and his colleagues. Joseph Vidal Alabal has been helping contain the virus in Spain. Uh, Gobeth Ranasing Am, sorry, Gobeth, I, I, I have troubles getting my tongue around uh, the Sri Lankan names, but has been on the front line in Sri Lanka, so thanks, Gobeth. Nagwa Hagazi has been leading the emergency remote teaching in her school and student support in Egypt. Mayara Floss has been advocating for her rural communities in Brazil. G. Uh, Gu has participated <coughs> both in the specific prevention and control work in the grassroots level in China. Susan Thomas is a nurse who's been on the COVID 
19 frontline in general practice and a lead for eight practices working in a small primary care cluster in South Wales. And Henry Lawson has been helping contain the virus in Ghana. So I'd like to pass over now to our panel. And I'd first uh, like to invite Michael Kidd uh, to give you his presentation. Uh, welcome, Michael. Thank you, Bruce, and thank you for the opportunity to join with everyone today. And uh, thank you to Wonka and to Donald and Anna and Garth and Harris and all the Wonka executive for the great work you're doing, continuing your advocacy for family medicine around the world. And thank you to everyone for listening in for the extraordinary work that you are doing, protecting the health and well-being of your individual patients and your communities in countries all over the world. It's been so inspiring to hear the stories uh, of many of you coming through uh, through the Wonka publications and from your colleges and societies. So thank you for all that you're doing. Uh, if we go to the next slide, Harris, I just thought I'd provide a very quick uh, overview of what's been happening with the pandemic in Australia. Like many countries, we had a very rapid rise in the number of uh, cases, and then we've seen that fall off as the country has gone uh, into lockdown. And just over the last few days, we've seen the lifting of uh, some restrictions, but a very tentative uh, lifting. We've had about 7,000 case, 7, cases right across the country and just under 100 uh, deaths from COVID-19. Can we move to the next slide, Harris? <clears throat> Part of my work uh, with the Australian government has been uh, responsibility for uh, part of the leadership of Australia's national primary care response. And one of the very first things we did was to set up a set of key principles about what should happen in a primary care response. And I wanted to share those with you. The first was about recognising the critical role of family medicine in protecting the most vulnerable people in each of our communities from the effects of COVID-19 and therefore why family medicine is an essential part of any country's response. The second was making sure that we preserve the functional capacity of family medicine to keep providing care for our patients with acute problems, with chronic disease problems, with mental health problems, needing preventive care and so forth. All the work that we normally do, but recognising from the experience of past pandemics and epidemics that often more people have significant morbidity and mortality related from other conditions rather than related to the infectious agent. So the importance of keeping family medicine functioning during a pandemic. The third was recognising that many people will have mild symptoms and these people will be managed by their family doctors in the community. And so ensuring that we were equipping and educating our family medicine workforce to look after people. And the fourth was recognising that people working in family medicine and primary care are just at, as much at risk as healthcare workers working in hospitals and other settings. So the importance of personal protective equipment being available to people working in family medicine and primary care, as well as people working in our hospitals so that we can protect our workforce uh, right across the nation. Uh, the next slide, please, Harris, shows uh, some of the interventions which we've been doing uh, in Australia. We've uh, introduced uh, telehealth for uh, all uh, family doctors. And as you can see, we've had nearly 10 million telehealth services delivered to Australians over the past uh, eight weeks. Uh, we've had the national uh, helpline with large numbers of people dialing in for assistance and advice advice about whether they should get tested and where that should take place. We've established nearly 500 respiratory clinics in metropolitan, regional and rural settings right across the country. And very importantly, these clinics help to segregate people with respiratory symptoms from people uh, with other conditions. And so, uh, and the, many of these clinics are run, set up and run by family doctors uh, across the country, including many of our rural family doctors. And finally, the, the amount of uh, infection control training which has been uh, offered with online training to protect our workforce in family medicine, in aged care, disability care, as well as in our hospitals. Uh, the final slide just shows uh, a couple of images uh, from 
uh, our respiratory clinics, which have been uh, set up on one side. You can see the details for clinics set up in metropolitan uh, South Australia and also in, in rural areas, just with advice for patients about how to access these clinics, the sort of services which are being provided. And then an image of uh, one of the clinics set up uh, in a series of demountables. And I think you can see there uh, Ewan McPhee, who I think is actually online at the moment, the president of the Australian College of Rural and Remote Medicine, who's one of the family doctors in Australia who has uh, picked up the challenge of, uh, of offering uh, a respiratory clinic for the people uh, in, his, uh, in his community. So that's where I'm going to stop, Bruce, but uh, thanks for the opportunity of joining you. Thanks very much, Michael, uh, and thanks very much for your leadership in Australia and, in fact, uh, obviously now and in the past, your leadership around the world. Um, the next uh, uh, person to uh, present is Desmond Wah. Oh, um, Desmond um, was, was a, uh, came to my attention as uh, someone in the, uh, featured in the New York Times over recent, uh, recent times. And uh, he uh, had to deal with a, uh, a group of patients in a very small rural hospital in Indiana. Um, so over to you, Desmond, to tell us what your uh, situation was. Thank you, Bruce. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Desmond, and I'm a uh, hospitalist, uh, mainly working in rural health care. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Rural Wonka for giving us the opportunity to participate. And I would like to start off first by telling you a little bit about Margaret Mary Health and then go into a little bit about our experience with uh, COVID-19 as a rural hospital. Um, Margaret Mary is a 25-bed critical access hospital. Uh, uh, the previous slide, uh, please, Harris. Um, Margaret Mary is a 25-bed critical access hospital. We have four ICU beds. Um, our scope is primarily outpatient services, um, and we also have a fairly robust oncology center. Uh, the picture on the left, um, there's a pin on the map. Batesville is located somewhere between Indianapolis and Cincinnati, and the closest major international travel hub would be Chicago, and that's toward your top left of the picture. Now, the population here is approximately 6,500 people, and the city has a total area of about 16 kilometers squared. Uh, the picture on the right shows our emergency department entrance and the COVID-19 drive through testing tent. Next slide, please. Um, about the COVID-19 crisis at Margaret Mary. Uh, we first had a positive patient um, around March 13th, and then a big surge happened towards the end of March, lasting until sometime late April. And what we would see is that patients would present with approximately the same constellation of symptoms. You have shortness of breath, you have nausea, you have diarrhea, myalgia, or fatigue, and then they will be found to be quite hypoxemic. Uh, virtually all patients had the characteristic chest x-ray findings that we see with COVID-19, the diffuse ground glass interstitial pattern as seen on the picture on the left. Um, and after being admitted, many of them would decompensate within 24 hours. Their follow-up chest x-rays would be much worse. Um, the image on the right is the same patient approximately 17 hours later and these patients would end up being intubated for imminent respiratory failure. Uh, next slide, please. There were uh, numerous clinical challenges in caring for these patients. Uh, first, our ICU is typically used for patients you know, needing close monitoring or for those on medication drips uh, for rapid atrial fibrillation or diabetic ketoacidosis. But with COVID-19, we actually ended up with more ventilators being used than actual ICU, uh, ICU rooms available and even ended up having to use rooms on the medical surgical unit. At one point, we had used up all six ventilators available and approximately 18 out of our 22 patients had a range of respiratory problems. Uh, secondly, uh, the amount of test kits available for COVID-19 was extremely limited. And on top of that, <clears throat> the initial turnaround times would range anywhere from four to 12 days after sending out the test. Um, another big challenge for us was when we ran out of our typical sedatives um, like propofol, midazolam, and we had to start using drugs like dexmedetomidine, ketamine, and even paralytics in large quantities, uh, which is something we typically don't do. 
we were fortunate enough to have our emergency docs and anesthesia department help us out with uh, things like intubations and some vent management. And this was indeed a blessing as one afternoon, a, a patient self-extubated and while a team was in his room getting him re-intubated, the patient next door somehow managed to disconnect his own ET tube. So thus a different team had to scramble and respond to that situation. And this would not have been possible if only one physician was on duty. From the administrative side of things, uh, there were also challenges. Uh, our CEO, Tim Putnam, spoke of not just uh, flattening the curve, but also raising the bar, which meant that as a healthcare system, we needed to prepare as much as possible to be able to meet the increased demands of the crisis we were facing. Uh, there was the creation of a search plan uh, to increase capacity from, any, uh, from our existing 25 beds all the way to 70 beds. Um, convert our obstetrics unit to another patient care unit, asking primary care doctors to help out in the hospital, hiring more staff, securing more equipment, and also deploying much needed telemedicine services. Um, we also took the initiative to meet with the uh, larger hospital systems in the Cincinnati area and kind of work together, um, such as being able to transfer our sicker patients to them where they could get comprehensive uh, critical care support, experimental treatments, or in turn, accepting some of their less critical patients and offload their facilities if they were at capacity. Next slide, please. Um, despite the challenges and uncertainty during this crisis, uh, there were definitely some bright spots and positive highlights for us. Uh, we were able to utilize an innovative invention called the intubation box. Um, you can see that in the picture on the left, which I'm sure most of us have seen. Uh, this can help to contain most of the aerosolized virus from spreading during intubation. Um, a bright spot for us was certainly being able to get our local community informed and involved. Uh, below, you can see some pictures. Um, the middle one is words of encouragement left um, by the community uh, at the entrance of the hospital. And then the picture on the right is one of many instances of uh, free food delivery delivered by um, local businesses to the hospital staff. And finally, we also uh, managed to develop a COVID-19 resource website, which was publicly available to the community. You know, all in all, uh, this shared experience definitely brought our team closer together, and we made it through that tough period with many, many lessons learned. Um, for anybody who's interested, uh, the New York Times uh, published an article highlighting some of the challenges faced by rural hospitals in the US, and uh, we were amongst the participants. Link is at the bottom of the slide. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Desmond, and, and I think you've shown us what it's like at the front line. Um, uh, I will ask people, uh, I noticed some questions coming in, uh, one from Rick there about uh, lessons uh, that have been learnt. So please keep those questions coming in and our, our uh, team with Sankar and Pratush uh, will be collecting those up for you uh, and uh, feeding them to Anna. Talking about bringing all the information together. Uh, John Wynne Jones uh, from Isolation in, uh, uh, in the UK has been doing just a fabulous job for us uh, getting uh, both the facts and the humanity together. So John, tell us what you've seen in that, uh, that last uh, uh, you know, couple of months that you've been doing that. Uh, thank you, Bruce. Um, I've spent the last eight weeks scanning social media and the internet and my aim was to find relevant news, opinions, scientific papers, education, and resources for rural health practitioners around the world. My initial concern that there was not much out there. Um, there's an infinite amount of information. People are getting information overload. And the World Health Organization calls it an infodemic. So I saw my role <clears throat> as someone to navigate the labyrinth on behalf of my colleagues in rural practice. I've collected information. I've sent out a daily newscast or a blog. I'll leave the poetry out this time because that's another story. Reading through the literature, there are three things that I became aware of very, very quickly. First of all, this is a new disease. It's changing all the time. It's certainly not flu. Secondly, this is a nasty disease. It's brutal out there. Healthcare professionals are witnessing experiences that none of us, none of us experienced doctors have seen in our lifetimes. Frightened people are dying. They're confused, terrified, and separated from their loved ones. And thirdly, there's no sense to this disease. It defies logic. 
it differs from country to country and region to region. I compared the figures from rich Western Europe, which has been particularly badly hit, with those of South Asia, and particularly with my colleague uh, Pratish Kumar from Bihar. He describes a different story, with fewer deaths, fewer infections, and a disease that impacts more on young people than older people. There's so much to this disease that we don't know. Let me try and describe some of the major topics that have filled the COVID-19 news headlines in the scientific community over the last eight weeks. No particular order, and I'm sure I've left some out. First of all, fake news. Even WHO and UN are concerned about the impact of fake news on the scientific response to the pandemic. It's clear that it's very disruptive. Bad science. Poor research is being put up on the internet. It's not peer reviewed and it's just been posted online. There's a lot of anger out there. It's aimed mainly at policymakers, managers and governments. The public and healthcare professionals feel that they've been left down. Worldwide, PPE is still a problem from the richest countries to the poorest countries. Lines of supplies are stretched, competed over, and there's considerable amount of racketeering and healthcare professionals have died as a result of it. Information mainly, sadly, comes from rich countries, or I've tried to incorporate poorer countries as well. There are major concerns on the impact of this disease on rural areas, where demography is different and resources are limited, and that's in rich and poor countries. Patients are frightened, or they don't want to bother their family doctors, so they're not attending. So people are saying, where are all the diseases? Where are the strokes? Where are the things that we normally see? Migration is an issue. There's special concern about the impact of the disease on rural healthcare systems, and in particular in the US, strangely. As COVID threatens rural areas, hospitals are closing down because they're becoming bankrupt and staff are being laid off. There's also mounting concern about the disproportionate impact of the disease on certain racial groups, indigenous populations and the poor. It's very interesting that MSF have been actually sent into the Navajo Nation. The worldwide emphasis on COVID is having a major negative impact on greater killers such as tuberculosis, malaria and HIV. And these diseases seem to have been sidelined. Mental health's a big issue now and into the future. The countries that coped with Ebola, SARS and MERS seem to have managed better. And much space is given to international and internal politics. And certain politicians, and I'm not going to mention any names, spend, uh, fill a lot of the news. So as a timeline, I've seen a change in the internet content. Initially, we saw resources, practical solutions and positive thinking. As time moves on, we see blame, despair and anger. There is genuine concern for the future of rural life, its impact on services, economies and jobs. The news now is dominated by concerns as to how will it all end? Will there be a second spike? Will the virus ever go away? Will there be a vaccine? And if so, when? What will be the cost in rural healthcare systems, in the jobs, in the economy? And will now be the no new normal? To finish, I've been aware of many personal and heroic stories, examples of great humanity and compassion in all full circumstances. The doctor who had managed a small hospital entirely on his own with little in the way of resources. The young newly qualified GP from Brazil sent out to an area with no previous experience and significant COVID infection, and yet she coped. The doctor who was so ill that she had to go to bed with COVID but continued to triage her patients from her bed because there was no one else to do it. Nurses, doctors, and not only healthcare professionals, but cleaners who camped out in caravans so as not to infect their own families. Staff using their own mobiles so the dying patients could be connected with their families for the last time. Healthcare professionals who kept working despite no adequate PPE or support and healthcare professionals who gave their lives when they knew they were at risk. This disease has brought the worst in a few, but the best in many. It's been a privilege to spend the last eight weeks in the digital world. Thank you.
Thanks, John. Um, Harris has just asked uh, me to um, cross to him because he's got some uh, news about some Zoom issues and then we'll be crossing straight to a video from our Bangladesh colleagues. Harris? Yes, uh, good day everyone. My name is Harris Lizidakis. I'm overviewing now the technical uh, um, uh, aspects of, uh, of our webinar. Just uh, to let you know that we were aware of some technical issues with Zoom. Uh, kindly, if you cannot see our screens or you cannot listen our audio, of course you cannot listen to what I'm saying right now, but kindly update your Zoom client to version 5 from the website of Zoom or alternatively, you can just follow the stream of the live stream on Facebook on our page. It's facebook.com slash Wonka world slash live. Uh, there, there are no issues, technical issues that you can watch uh, the whole webinar there. Uh, that's it for me and uh, the word back to you, Bruce. Thank you. Thanks, Harris. Can we run, can we run the video please, if that's possible? Okay, with that opening, we'll go across to Zakur from uh, Bangladesh and uh, Primary uh, Care and Rural Health from Bangladesh. To you, Zakur. Thanks, Bruce. Thank you all. Well, uh, mask is better than ventilator. Home is better than ICO. Let's start our stories. March 28, Jamal, at 32 years, day labor came to our clinic with history of uh, fever for three days. And uh, my colleague uh, received taking history and after examination advised him for whom quarantine. He replied, how is possible being six member family lived in a less than 200 square meter room, how I maintain social distancing before COVID-19 we will die rather hunger. Any of you, these sorts of experience? Next. So, most of you, next, here is. Most of you guys heard about PPE, but it's very hard for even our doctor and healthcare worker. The previous slide, a young lady done genome sequencing of COVID-19 and we are doing so many lot. Our doctor introduced ivermectin and uh, doxycycline with some patients and uh, they hope it will work for COVID-19. So we have some innovation in a small country that is eight most populous country. You know, social distancing, we're not maintaining because densely populated people, but our pet animal try to follow our instruction. And we are trying to managing uh, PPE as well as to serve our colleagues, those who are despite PPE, serve the nation. Next. Here is. Here is, are you hearing? So when patient comes to us, we maintain a trials like others. We maintain a uh, three trials like that uh, with the epidemiological history, high risk, 
no, no clear epidemiological history, but fever, median risk, and others are uh, low risk. We received a patient in uh, April 2nd, a retired banker, and uh, with uh, respiratory distress, fever, and loose motion, and ultimately uh, diagnosed as uh, positive COVID-19 by RT-PCR, and advised to home isolation. He maintained it, and within two weeks, he got oil. Because, next, we only encourage uh, severe respiratory distress and uh, oxygen situation less patient to come to hospital or are admitted to hospital when worse the situation. And uh, you see, we have uh, so many COVID-19 dedicated hospital. This hospital is, uh, I remember, visited by my friend John and Garg last year on the eve of World Royal Health Conference in Dhaka. Now the 400 bed teaching hospital along with 100 bed isolated COVID hospital. And uh, me, when in action and when in plan or holidays. Next, please. It is. Thanks, it is. So testing, testing, and testing by WHO and everybody know that we need it. But sometimes test is uh, managed by our people and done and test positive. They hide it because of social discrimination, you know, by media. And uh, ultimately, they infect the society. And it sometimes uh, hampered their uh, last program like uh, in graveyard or uh, something others. So they are hide it and they infect our doctors as well. Next, please. That is. So these are our health fighter doctors. They are very near to us. They died. They are served their patients until their last breath. We salute them. We mourn for them. But you see the left side, 100 faces of our future. They are growing up. They are still, they're doing a lot. We are very proud of them. And uh, they all are inspiration for the rest of the globe. They are uh, doing active part for our health system. Though we have so many limitation, but we are doing oil. And uh, they are doing oil for our preparation conference, but they are now certified volunteer for COVID-19. They help government uh, tool and they help in telemedicine. Some of them uh, giving other uh, social issues. They food, the, those who are vulnerable or need. That's the issue. We are not treating the patient. Being a family physician, you know, we are doing other things. They are sometimes very important than uh, giving the prescription of treatment like that. And uh, they are very doing well. They manage ambulance. And they are uh, helping uh, people to come to hospital and then uh, health awareness. And, these people are making the video. I am doing nothing. They are making the video. Next, please. Next, here is. And we share everything for betterment of our people. And uh, definitely, we will work together and we will win over COVID-19. So many disasters we face. So it may take time. It may take uh, people. But uh, once we uh, win over COVID, then what about post-COVID thoughts? All my family medicine colleagues, you are doing a lot. But any thoughts from us? Thank you all. Thank you very much for passion sharing. Thanks, Akur. And it reminds us uh, of the sacrifices of rural doctors all around the world and those of your colleagues. And uh, obviously our thoughts go out to them and their families, but also all of your patients and the particular issues that there are in lower and middle income countries with social distancing. And I'm sure we'll have some discussion around that. Um, our next speaker is uh, Josep uh, Vidal Alabal, who's from Spain. Uh, Josep has been uh, involved uh, very much uh, in the epidemiology uh, in Spain and also in his own small hospital which has uh, transformed quite markedly uh, since the crisis so over to you Jose. Oh hello uh, good morning from Catalonia. Uh, Harris if you can put the slides. Yes next slide. Yes. Well as probably you know Spain has been one of the worst affected countries in the world. Next slide. 
And particularly my nation, Catalonia, we had lots of cases in mid-March, and especially in, in, my, in my own area, in the Catalan Central Region. This is a small rural area, but although directly rurality should protect from COVID because we have less uh, population density, we had lots of, of cases of COVID and it this faced a, a huge challenge for us. Next slide. Because what happened, it can very, well, very suddenly. So we had uh, many, many health professionals affected either by infection, COVID-19, but most of them, they were quarantined because we didn't have protective equipment at the beginning, or we didn't know that we were dealing with so many patients with COVID. So we had to quarantine a lot of health professionals. So what we had to do is we had to close uh, many small practices, mainly rural practices, because we didn't, we didn't have a staff to just to run them. So we have to concentrate all the health uh, services in, in big health centers in the, in the medium cities. And it changes, this changes everything. Because what happened is that we have to reduce face-to-face uh, -face visits. We had to separate possible COVID cases from non-COVID cases. And we have to concentrate on, on doing home visits. And then on the top of this, we had a huge problem with nursing home. We have lots of cases in nursing homes, uh, and this also affects the primary care teams because we have to do over the healthcare in the nursing homes. So we had to deploy teams to go every day to all the nursing homes in the area just to give to give medical support. Next slide, please. Uh, what what has happened? Basically, as I say, we had a huge increase in non-face-to-face -face visits. For the first time in primary care in Catalonia, we had more non-face-to-face -face visits than face-to-face than -face visits. It was the first time it happened. So basically, which, ty which type of, of non-face-to-face -face visit we had? We had, of course, telephone calls. We, used, uh, we are using a lot uh, the telephone calls because we are triaging patients. But we are so, because in primary care, we are doing all the follow-up of all the COVID cases that are they're at home or they have been discharged from hospital. So every day we follow up all these cases just using the telephone. We, we are using virtual visits, uh, something that we had before, just is like tasks with prescription sick notes. We are using e-consultations that uh, we had this, but we are not using it a lot. But now we are using uh, e-consultation to send sick notes, to send repeat prescriptions. Patients can send us pictures and we can reply to them. And for the last two weeks, we, we had the video consultations as well. Next slide, please, Harish. Uh, this is important because uh, the e-consultations and the video consultations, they are part of the electronic medical records. So they are secure. What we write in, the, in an e-consultation, it goes to the electronic medical records. So it's a, a, a secure way to send pictures to send repeat prescriptions. Uh, next slide, please. And here is, is how you can see in this graph is, is very clear because in the blue blue line is a face-to-face -face visits and you can see how they drop in, from mid-March mid and how increase the telephone consultation. They are the green lines and also the, the purple lines are the e-consultations. So you can see the huge drop in face-to-face -face visits and the, the increase in non-face-to-face -face visits. Next slide, please. Uh, what will happen in the future? Well, the future and in the present, I think that nothing will be the same uh, for, I think, a long, a long, long time uh, because it, it will, it may take a long time to, to go back to the pre-COVID situation. So it is clear that we'll have to do fewer face-to-face -face visits. We have to do this because we cannot have many people waiting in the waiting room. Sorry, my time is up, sorry. And what we'll have to do is to, to increase the telemedicine services. Uh, for this, it's important just to involve patients 
also we need to train professionals because this is a different way to, to do consultation. So we, we need to train professionals and we need to be sure that there are not inequalities in accessing these telehealth services. So I think this is important just to avoid uh, having inequalities. Next slide, please. And thank you very much for you, your attention. Thanks, Jose, and thanks to your team, obviously, and all the work you've done with that. Uh, uh, next is, is Gobbeth Ratnassingham, who's from uh, Sri Lanka. Gobbeth's been on the front line uh, in some of the hospitals in uh, Sri Lanka, dealing with some of the cases and also uh, preventing, obviously, the, uh, the spread. So over to you, Gobbeth. Uh, good evening. Uh, family doctors on the front line. Have a slide, please. Uh, Sri Lanka is an island country with a population of uh, 22 million. From there, uh, 70 persons are living in the rural area and have a great network of uh, three public and primary care facilities. So there has been placed many uh, measures to control the pandemic condition, such as uh, closure and limitation at the end point. Like as an island country, we don't have the borders and we uh, cut down the airport and ports. Also, screening processes has been placed there to find out the important cases. The local cases also traced through the community screening and the uh, uh, country was uh, cut, uh, locked down for the more than two months. And also effective quarantine isolation processes are being uh, implemented. Uh, as a family physician on the front line, as you can see the picture. So we still do all routine works in a modified manner. The, in the left side, we do the limited face-to-face -face consultation with the precautionary and infection preventive measures. Also, we increase the telemedicine and teleconsultation via audio and video platforms. This is uh, one of the uh, that mobile app and all. So it's a free, accessible to free to the public. And also the art of home visits on practice for the emergency basis. Overall, as a physician, we do all the health needs for the community and with a great passion. Next step, please. At the community, the awareness program and the contact tracing has been arranged. The first picture is that we are visiting the contact tracing and subsequently they are being underwent uh, testing and suspected patients are isolated and the rest of the treated in the hospitals. And other uh, pictures are from the call center and the call and coordinator center are effectively assisted by the uh, medical students and community health workers. They are doing a tremendous job here and the medication and essential are delivered to the doorstop by the help of uh, volunteers, health officers and postal department. Also here, I have to mention the non-communicable diseases, chronic condition and aged care services are maintained without interruption. Next slide, please. Yeah, preparedness action plan was developed to face the pandemic condition in the hospital as well. There are many designated hospital were named around the country to treat the patients. And uh, this is a new disease, so additional training card allocations, medical supply, and testing facilities are pre-imposed. You can see the picture from the left side, that the gathered uh, patient and visitors are kept in the temporary shelter. They don't, they have trash according with the symptom and history, and they are sent for the uh, respiratory or non respiratory treatment pathway. Also, we arrange the telecommunication facilities as well. We always uh, do the uh, preventing and infection control measures. Next, next uh, slide, please. Uh, how we prepared? In fact, the Fafi Health meeting and local and international collaboration with the sharing experience are conducted regularly. Also, the guidelines for the primary care physicians and general practitioners are developed with the approval of Minister of Health and uh, it was uh, updated wisely. Uh, these are the picture with this, our one of the spice food dunk doctors movement, also at the executive meeting, uh, and also the public awareness has delivered through the available media and social platform. You can see I'm up here on the TV and, and also in the live uh, Facebook live, and also the one car website video as Next slide, please. Uh, 
Next slide, please. Uh, likewise, other part of the world, we too had a lot of challenges during the pandemic. There, as I said, there are shortage of personal protective equipment and the essential weather noted. You can see the left side. This is we have used the porkin as a uh, uh, alternative, and we made it the PPE. So middle is the myself doing uh, my uh, sample collection before that. Later, we all managed with our own innovation and product, uh, local production. In additionally, increasing the risk of infection, long working shift, family isolation, burnout, and uh, physician well-being are at risk. Finally, we are already here in the game against the deadly virus, and we will fight with the last and save the world. Next, please. Let me greet with the traditional way to uh, say greeting. Vanakkam, I bhuvan, namaste. Happy Family Doctors Day, which is coming in two days. Thank you. Thanks, Gobeth, and and really inspiring what you're doing there. And I think the innovation that uh, that shows with rural doctors and the the uh, ability to adapt to difficult circumstances is. Uh, is truly amazing. So thanks for that. Um, talking about adaption, we're going to now go to Nagwa Hagazi, who's uh, uh, on our council and uh, uh, from Egypt and involved very much in uh, family doctor education. How's that adapting, uh, Nagwa? Um, hello, everyone. Um, uh, medical education uh, during the COVID era uh, had been witnessing a dramatic uh, changes. Uh, I'm going to talk about our experience, uh, specifically about our school experience with nearly around uh, 6,000 uh, undergraduate uh, medical students. Uh, our half decade uh, learning management system had been abandoned and it had been heavily used with a paradigm shift from the luxury of e-learning as an educational choice into an e-learning as a sole choice. Actually, this had revealed a lot of points that need to be addressed. For an example, amplified inequity. If you are going to talk about amplified inequity, we have to understand that 70% uh, of our medical students are using the learning management systems via their smartphones and they don't have laptops. Also, we have to understand an important point that one third of our medical students are living in a rural area. And is that a problem? Once there was a dropout of the assignments and follow-up complaints from our students due to the limited resources and demographic character characters in that places. For an example, electricity cut down, weak internet coverage and technological issues in comparison to the urban area. So there was an educational inequity between the urban and the rural students due to the technological infrastructure and economic status. Uh, how that had been solved, actually uh, the materials, uh, the e-learning materials had been provided to our students on DVD and they had been uh, exemption from the online assignments. Uh, recently, we were unable to come and take these materials because of the lockdown and uh, because of the inaccessibility to get them. So, uh, we are facing a lot of problems. This is one of them, which is the virtual learning. If you are going to talk about another issues, it's going to be the uncertainty. We are living the uncertainty period for us and for our students. And as you see, as a director of the Medical Education and Human Resources Development Center in our school, we had to declare that to our students and to be transparent with them. We are uncertain and stressed as much as they are because we are living uh, um, exceptional moments at this period. Next, please, Harris. Uh, during these periods, we have to understand that our students are facing um, uh, stressors because they lose their compass in the roadmap. And that's why our Vice Dean for Educational and Student Affairs had been addressing our students with each important decision. Next. 
Next, please. Yes, thank you. As a part of the mental issues here, we have to be uh, taking care of the psychological well-being of our students. Uh, this had been uh, done through different things. For an example, uh, we have been uh, doing uh, live streaming uh, videos uh, using our psychiatric, uh, psychological uh, dog physicians with us who had been addressing our students how they can cope with the stressors they are having. Uh, the Ministry of Health and Population also here had launched a hotline for the healthcare professionals and also for the community in order if they are having or facing any type of stressor, how can they be uh, dealing with that stressor and how they can do the support for them. Uh, so um, when we are in the e-learning era, do we have pros and cons? Yes, we have pros and cons and we have to make use of it till the maximum we are doing it. So, uh, uh, next please, Harris. Uh, this is a picture from our community practice. Uh, as you had seen um, uh, from a rural area, uh, we cannot, people cannot be put uh, into, out, uh, into uh, out of business for a prolonged time. So based on the situation, as you are, see, you are seeing in the picture, uh, the sellers are staying uh, in around blocks where they had been determined and had been told that they have to be distanced within these uh, blocks where there is a space between each seller and another one and also the seller Sellers and the uh, uh, buyers are all um, uh, uh, are all wearing masks. Uh, uh, this is because unemployment rate is high, especially in the ruler practice. Unemployment rate is high, especially in the ruler practice, and you cannot ask people to stop uh, uh, to stop. their life. Um, uh, there had been efforts uh, done by the uh, non-governmental organizations in order to support these peoples uh, via monthly payments. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Nagwa, and uh, for that insight into, into what's happening. And I think uh, there's been a real revolution in, in medical school uh, teaching and postgraduate teaching. Now to Mayara, um, who's known to you all, I'm sure, as uh, really one of the founders of Rural Seeds and uh, been a great advocate for her people in rural areas in Brazil. Over to you, Mayara. So good morning from Brazil to you all. Um, I've a part of uh, I think apart from the coronavirus is striking all the world and all the rich countries. I don't feel that that equal to how it reach uh, Brazil, where people cannot quarantine, where social di distancing is a huge issue, where we have PPI. Please don't don't change the slides yet. Uh, the, the slide before and uh, that we are facing a huge crisis, uh, so political crisis. I don't think it strikes equally. I think uh, who is in, in the edge of the world is getting in a, in a worse situation because hunger is a thing that we had before and the, the immune system is getting worse. So we also talk about this huge crisis that we are, we are facing here and also I use the term of the necropolitics here where we know that some people is getting less access to care than others. So saying that before I go uh, further, we do have the project of the rural health success stories. We have two stories so far about uh, what's going on in the world. Uh, the both of them are from Brazil. I would like to invite everybody that's watching here to write. We have uh, some people that can help translating it into English and also publishing in your native language. And I think it's really, really important for us to have a broad idea of what's going on in Brazil, in the world, and also in other parts of the world that couldn't have the time to write a full article 
we are searching for stories and how it's been the experience in the front line. So next. Yeah, so just bringing a very quick um, idea, we have done a WhatsApp radio program where I work. So we have spread it now in Brazil. Other um, health units are doing it. We are recording on the consultory room and then recording with uh, like these microphones and is spreading into the community. We have helped another five health, health, basic health, primary healthcare units to get this uh, through. And uh, I think it's very interesting to see what's the results and the uh, people getting more uh, feel the sense of care and having trust in the in the doctor's voice, in the nurse's voice, and the uh, health primary health team voice, which I think it's really interesting with, with what we are living now uh, with a infodemia, a fake news uh, pandem pandemia. So we need to be aware also, and then having these micro politics where we can talk with our community is very interesting. So if you need more, uh, I can I can. Get another time to talk more about that. Next. Well, we started here in Brazil. We did a quarantine that was a really interesting that we have a virtual camping for indigenous people. And we also are doing a lot of telehealth during the quarantine. But what I decide to bring today to talk next, it's uh, just talking a little bit about what's going on. I just want to show this map from that had a, a more, more than 150 kilometers from São Gabriel da Cachoeira, which is the most indigenous city or, or region in Brazil. We have 90% of people there that are indigenous. And the distance is three days by river, 26 hours by quick boat and airplane by two hours. But the next days, they are to have someone transferred to Manaus, which is the capital of the state in the middle of the Amazon. You are taking more than three days to transfer this patient. So we cannot, and then last week, they run it out oxygen. And uh, this kind of region and the doctors are more deeply pushed in isolation. And mainly the community is suffering a lot uh they are not reaching the, the adequate care and the next ECU bed is in Manaus which is 800 kilometers three days now to transfer the patient and that's what we are living now we have can you go to the next we have already a lot of indigenous people that were dying this is an artist uh, from the design ethnicity and he died by probably by COVID, probably because we are not testing enough as well. We don't have tests enough, not just in Amazon, but all Brazil, we are testing very low and uh, people are dying. Please the next, that's next. Yes, that, uh, this one. This is uh, just on Friday, 92 indigenous were killed by coronavirus in Brazil. So we don't have that much to make these misstrongs. And uh, I, I think I'm very sad about that. And uh, just for you to have an idea also, the size of the, the, just one city from Amazon is the size of England. It's 110 kilometers square, and uh, England have 130. So that's how coronavirus add a magnifier glass to what's inequity and what we are living. The next. And further, to do a huge, uh, to make it worse, uh, uh, aggravating it, we're still burning Amazon in the last month. We have 500 square kilometers burned of biomass burning in our forest. This is for sure something that affects our climate and for sure affects our rural and remote 
communities and uh, I wish we can also discuss this today. Thank you. Thanks very much, Maya, and it does highlight the isolation and the um, sometimes lack of uh, just information about what's happening in rural areas. Um, uh, next, we go to Ji Gu from China and Ji with uh, Gu Yuan, who's been a long-term member of our working party, have been very involved in the primary care response in, in China. So over to you, Ji. Thank you, Bruce. Hello, everyone. It's my honor and pleasure to present in this global webinar. Same as in other countries, there's a shortage of medical staff and supplies in China's rural areas. But beyond that, China has some unique characteristics. First, the awareness of personal protection of rural residents is weak, and their personal hygiene habits are poor. Second, rural residents most have a larger social circle. They, they like uh, visiting relatives and gathering with their friends. And the third, the outbreak coincided with the Chinese Lunar New Year. Millions of migrant workers returned home in rural areas in Spring Festival which leads to high people level flow. In response, China has taken a number of uh, uh, supportive measures. For example, local governments made great efforts on production and supplies to ensure the providing of masks, disinfectants, and other prevention materials. Through the construction of online platform, emergency training for rural doctors were intensified to improve their knowledge of COVID-19. Next slide, please. The rural doctors in China have large job responsibilities. Their primary work is routine medical practice. But while in the pandemic, they extended to conduct epidemiological investigations, screen patients with fever, follow up close contacts, reports epidemic information, and participate in environment disinfection. Next slide. Next slide, please. Most, important, most importantly, they strengthen health education among people. They spread the basic knowledge of COVID-19 through bulletin boards and the leaflets. They teach the elderly and the children how to wear masks and wash their hands so as to improve the awareness of infection prevention. Next slide. During the pandemic, home order forced people to stay at home. Next, next slide, please. But on the other hand, it greatly promoted the development of internet medical care. Online medicine has many advantages. For example, it can overcome, overcome the barrier of distance to provide medical care to remote areas. And it mitigates human resources shortage of medical experts across the country. And it's also minimized the gathering and the physical contact. It can provide multiple access. You can use emails, videos, conference, and mobile phones. And it also promotes interdepartmental and multidisciplinary care. Next, next slide, please. In fact, online medicine and service have played an important role in the fight against the pandemic. In e-hospital, we set up a COVID-19 dedicated consultation channel to initially screen potential patients. We provide online diagnosis and treatments for those patients with stable chronic diseases. Then drugs will be sent to the patients by express delivery. In addition, the e-system supports to remotely monitor close contacts for compliance with the rules of medical observation. We also leverage online consulting to mitigate the anxiety and panic among the public. In addition to online medicine and consultation, e-platforms are powerful for other uses. We just mentioned the online training for rural doctors. The webinars are widely used for exchange meetings, both local and international level. It's much easier that people 
than, than before to discuss prevention and control measures with each other. China has established a nationwide web-based web academic reporting system to collect timely and accurate information in all parts of the country. Next. Finally, I would like to remind you of the importance of uh, publicity in the fights. And this set of pictures titled, I am not a doctor, call on all industries to do their best to fight the pandemic. Well, that's some information about rural China. Thank you. Thanks, G, and uh, thanks very much for those insights into how, obviously, with China, it was a, a very early and initial problem there, and, and the ability of you guys to get on and treat that was uh, really astounding. So over to Susan Thomas now. Susan's one of our uh, uh, general practice nurses who uh, has been at the front line in, in Wales and uh, we'd like to hear your experience. Thanks, Susan. Thank you, Bruce. And um, hello, everybody. Um, yes, I'm, I'm um, speaking from Wales here this morning um, and um, very pleased to be with you all. Um, you can see from my first slide, um, because I don't think you can see me on screen. Um, my photograph is there, I'm on the left, so hello to you all. I work as a, as a nurse within a, a small team of uh, myself, two other nurses and a couple of um, healthcare assistants within um, a, a, a practice situation in a place called Risca. Um, next slide, please, Harris. Um, we have approximately 9,000 patients registered with us. And um, just to let you know that locally within Wales, we have seen the highest rates of COVID infection. Um, in fact, our numbers have been equal to those within London at some point. So actually really uh, very worrying for us all. Um, in terms of the numbers of people that we have, it, it, it's worked out so far that we know of that we have about 1% of our um, registered patients affected by COVID. And um, that's just to give you a little bit of background. In terms of the nursing contribution um, during this period of time, uh, just to let you know that probably we've seen the least change to nurses working day uh, in usual times than those within the medical team. So, for example, face-to-face -face patient contact has continued um, and continues, whilst the medical team did um, switch to telephone or video consults um, sooner. I think probably reflecting, we've um, one of the strengths of the nursing team has been that we've maintained business as much as usual as possible for our population's health needs. You know, we've been really flexible. Um, across the whole board, and I'm, although my um, experiences of, of, of our small practice, it's very, very um, similar to um, experience across Wales. Um, decisions have been made really rapidly. In many ways, it's been quite liberating that we've been able to make the changes that we've needed. Um, and certainly from the beginning, any early changes that we made to our, our practice was in order to reduce and control risk of, of infection for patients and for staff, but also to prepare for, at the time, what was unknown, but nevertheless we expected an increase in demand from our patients with the increase of COVID. So some of the things, next slide, sorry, Harris. Um, some of the decisions that we made earlier on in order to try and reduce the um, need for patients who are a bit more vulnerable to have to come to the practice. We looked at our patients who have atrial fibrillation, for example, and along with our uh, specialist um, colleagues, uh, made the sw switch from um, warfarin to, to DOAC medicines. We've looked at making changes to um, B12s and to long-acting um, contraceptions, as you can see on the slide. But we've also spent a lot of time um, working our way to support our, our people who have long-term or chronic conditions um, in switching from face-to-face -to, -face to phone or video. Uh, we, we started by prioritizing people with um, diabetes who have a high HbA1c, people with COPD who are high users of their inhalers or respiratory medicines. We've also encouraged self-care for people who perhaps might have wounds. Um, and we've been very proactive in, in trying to support people who are more vulnerable, who are staying away from the surgery. So for example, our frail population, people who have a dementia diagnosis, 
people who are shielding and shielding is a UK initiative to keep certain groups of people isolated at home, people who have cancer, who are immunosuppressed, who have transplants, etc. And we've worked very closely with our social care and third sector providers to help to achieve that. Alongside that, we've been trying to plan for um, people who haven't been admitted to hospital, but who are very unwell at home. For example, people who might need end of life care um, support. So we've been preparing, even though we usually work at the surgery, we've been preparing to support people within their own homes, which just needs uh, sort of close working with our community nursing colleagues and palliative care colleagues. At the same time, um, on a national level, the um, national programmes for cancer screening have been suspended, so we aren't doing any smears or, or, or bowel screening at the moment, although the childhood immunisation programme does continue. Uh, next slide, please, Harris. So that just gives you a flavour of, 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 of what the nursing team has been doing. Um, I, I also have another role within the, within the practice, which has developed most recently, and that is of... Um, being asked to, to lead and coordinate the, the practice COVID plan. Um, so I started by looking at um, how we could in, in, implement uh, infection prevention and control, not only to protect um, patients and staff, both clinical and non-clinical. And we spent a lot of time in the early days preparing for the worst. You know, we really didn't know what was going to happen. So for example, the surgery was divided into two. We had a COVID wing so that we could um, help to um, keep people separated, those who were suspected or known to have COVID or, or at least symptoms of and those who didn't. Um, so that, that's worked very well. And we've had to have constant open communication. We put in place, I put in place daily early morning briefings, updating and sharing on, on news as it came along very rapidly, as you're all aware, and planning as to the next stages really, both short, medium and long term. We did a lot of sharing of skills just in case anybody um, became unwell and, and, and couldn't uh, work or even if they weren't unwell, but that maybe that members of their family caused them to isolate. So making sure that nobody was, was um, um, seen as, as dispensable, no, indispensable. <laughs> uh, PPE was something I had to coordinate uh, and in the early days that, that was a bit of a daily um, uh, nightmare but things have settled down now. And as other people have said, we had to look a lot to the tech to support both on-site and remote working. So for example, making sure that everybody had access to a laptop so that we could continue to work even if we were isolating at home, full access to records and all of that sort of thing. And we've done massive learning, just as other people have explained, um, video consultations. Very lucky that there's a UK um, entrepreneur um, uh, who has put in place an excellent package. So we've had to learn all about that, as well as patients, of course. And we've, we've, we've brought some very elderly, non-techie patients along with us, and we've had some wonderful results. Uh, and I could tell you more about that if there was more time. Uh, next slide, please, Harris. So plan for the future. Well, our, our experience to date of the first wave anyway, we've actually had low numbers of COVID presentation in, in, in primary care. That, that would be fair to say across Wales, really, mainly because people are told to self-isolate for seven days if they have suspected COVID. So from our point of view, it's the occasional um, care of them with symptoms or maybe through the requirement for antibiotics. Um, because people have tended to get sick, as you all know, very quickly, very badly, and have bypassed primary care to get direct to hospital for their care. Um, so at the moment, we're thinking ahead. So for example, we'll have the flu vaccination season starting in about September, and we're going to be doing that during a period of two metre personal distancing, and we need to help 1,800 people approximately. We usually have a very full waiting room of people coming through our flu clinic, so to speak. So how are we going to do that one? That's, 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 those things are in our minds, especially in the weather, because at the moment we're lucky to have had very, very pleasant weather for the last um, few weeks. So we'll be returned to normal. Other people have asked that question as well. We're taking the opportunity at the moment to take stock, to housekeep, really um, quite enjoying that opportunity in many ways. Um, despite the fact that there are tragedies happening all around us and we are preparing for a new normal, whatever that's going to look like. And we're certainly learning every day. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sue. And, and it certainly brings to us uh, yeah, what will be the future in, in uh, rural practice or indeed general practice um, more generally. Over now to Henry Lawson in Ghana. And uh, Henry's uh, had particular obviously lots of experience with infectious disease, but uh, facing a new challenge, Henry, and thanks for letting us know how you're going.
So thank you, everybody. I am um, greetings from Accra in Ghana. Next slide, please. So I start off my presentation with uh, an empty room. That is what happened to us in Ghana. We started working with the experience from Europe and China and Asia, the kinds of cases they were seeing. We started screening at the airport using the thermometer and symptoms and signs. I will put in a lot of effort into that. Unfortunately, cases kept go coming into the country because we were not picking them. Then we realized that most of our cases were asymptomatic or had mild disease. In fact, there's a, there's a doctor who got the disease and the only symptom she had was loss of smell. No temperature, no fever, no cough, no running nose, no chest pain, no difficulty in breathing, muscle aches, all the case definition uh, signs and symptoms were not found in this patient. However, she was tested because of um, um, a routine testing that was being done in her facility. So we realized that for doctors working in, in everyday practice, we needed a very high index of suspicion to be able to pick cases that were uh, COVID positive. Next slide. And so instead of sitting in the hospital and waiting for patients to come in ill, and then we check, do the uh, COVID test on them to diagnose the disease, we started a whole different prog program, which we called enhanced contact tracing. If we find a certain number of people within a particular community having posti tested positive, then a team from the, from the Ghana Health Service would go into the whole community and zone them out and test every person within the household. And within a short period of time, we began to see a trend that the cases were concentrated initially in the urban areas that had uh, well-to-do people living in there because most of the earlier cases we got came in, uh, were imported from outside. Now, over time, we realized that community spread uh, began. And so contact tracing, individual contact tracing was being done. And then this enhanced uh, contact tracing where the communities were being targeted was also being done. Next slide. And so what we had to do was to promote the COVID precautions. And number one was hand washing. We needed people to wash their hands as often as possible. And now we had this contraption developed many years ago by a nurse in Ghana, and we call it the Veronica bucket. And so there was a craze everywhere because the government put out um, instructions that every facility you enter, shop, supermarket, hospital, office, should provide um, something that would help people wash their hands before they enter. And this contraption allows everybody to wash their hands with running water. The good thing about the um, device is that the tap um, is operated like a water dispenser. And so once you lift it up, the water flows, you drop it down, the water cuts off. The soap is available on the right, and then there's a tissue, the water runs into the bowl under the tap, and then the bucket on the left is used to collect the used uh, tissue paper. And so this promoted hand washing among the community. Every place you go around, we had Veronica buckets to help people keep to their precautions. Next slide. And so the doctors in the community, our task was to be able to identify cases or to help the, uh, the Ghana Health Service identify hot spots, go in there and pick the cases. There were a few that came into the hospital. And our responsibility then was that because we, most cases were asymptomatic, we had to wear protective equipment. Every nurse, every doctor working within primary care had to be well protected because the cases were walking in and they were not showing any symptoms. Now, those that were picked were sent to already designated centers that we called COVID treatment centers. And the picture you see is one beautiful hospital, a, a quaternary hospital that had been built in Ghana, which had not yet been um, fully operational. And they had uh, about six 
ICU suites. And so they were earmarked for train and training and then treatment of cases that tested positive. So after quarantine, if your test comes back and you're positive, you were sent to a treatment center. And the good news was that your treatment was free, your room and board, and there was not, no bills to pay. And so there was very little resistance in getting patients who tested positive to move into these centers. Uh, after, after treatment at these centers, there were vehicles that were designated to take you to your home because we wanted to monitor the, um, where people lived and if test results, because the test, because we we're doing so many tests, there were times when test results kept long before they come back. So sometimes you have seven days to eight days before your test results come back. And because we're using double negative tests before you'll be allowed to leave the isolation center, there were times where there was pressure to get um, patients who, who are tested negative to go home because you've tested negative, we are waiting for your second negative test and you're still in the center, uh, blocking the chance for those who were positive and needed a place to be treated in isolation. And so this made us change the plan as we went along. So we changed our case definition, we changed our treatment plan, and we changed the when we allowed people to go home so that we were able to cover quite a large number of people. And we've seen the statistics from Ghana. We've had a lot of acclaim from the World Health Organization for the way we have handled the COVID testing. Next slide. So thank you all um, and have a wonderful Sunday. Thanks very much, Henry. Um, uh, we've had just a, a plethora, a wonderful uh, lot of uh, both presentations and questions. Um, we're running really a bit behind time and running out of time. I might um, ask Anna, uh, who's been collecting some of the themes and the questions to um, just summarize some of those. And with John's permission, I think what we might do, John, is take this to the Google group. Please, if you, if you haven't been on the, uh, on the Google group, uh, then you can, you can get onto that. And, and John left his uh, email further up in the chat. But I think the best way to talk through these issues would be to bring them to the Google group, because I think we're rapidly over time or running out of time. But Anna, if you could just, uh, uh, maybe summarise things, and then I'll uh, I'll just check in with John to see that that's the right way to go. Anna, you're on mute. You need to unmute. Anna, you're on mute. Anna, uh, unmute. While Anna's getting the mute situation there, John, did you want to just make a quick comment about, uh, I think this is a, a, a wonderful use for the Google group to talk through these topics because there's been, I've just been following it as best I can, but there's been some great chat. John? I, I would agree entirely, Bruce. There's, there's a huge amount of really rich information and stuff out there. Can I just give people who are not members of the Google group my email address? It's very simple. It's John at John WJ, so there's no dots, it's johnwj.com. It's a very easy email address. I've already added three people to it this, this, after, this morning mm -hmm. already. So please, please, if you want to join the Google group, we'd like to have you on board. With our Google group, the Warsaw Google group, uh, the European one, we've got getting on for 3,000 people on it. So it's a really good... Uh, um, <coughs> Uh, community to join. So please, please. So it's john at johnwj.com. Send me an email and I'll add you. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks, John. And I think we will go to chat on that. I'm just noticing we've lost Anna and unfortunately she's been able, unable to unmute. Um, I think we might go to the final slides and if we can get Anna back on, um, then that would be good. Otherwise, uh, uh, we'll just uh, conclude with a few closing remarks and uh, over to Donald after that. So just back one, if we could, uh, 
uh, I think, yeah. So thanks very much. Uh, in preparation for DACA, uh, we had an international panel of experts preparing some key workshops. Um, and But in this virtual world, we're um, having to switch uh, to these becoming lectures and webinars. Um, if you look through that slide there, you'll see there are 11 uh, lectures that have replaced our workshops in Dhaka. Um, and they're about really important issues that continue on and in fact sometimes have been enhanced and, in, and highlighted by the circumstances we find ourselves with COVID-19. So we've done these in partnership with Towards Unity Health. Next slide, please, um, uh, if we could. Oh, wrong way. Next one. Um, and so the World Rural Health Conference uh, uh, 2020, the 17th Rural Health Conference does continue on. Um, as I said, these lectures will be available uh, to you in the next little while. In addition to the lectures, there's an opportunity for all of you, uh, particularly those who put abstracts together to, for the conference, to submit those abstracts to World Rural Health Conference. That's the WRHC2020 at gmail.com. And there's also a chance for you to be able to publish uh, your studies as well um, in the Social Innovations Journal. And we've got some really great opportunities. So for you to present at a webinar, see the lectures and also present in that journal. So I'll <coughs> hand back over to Donald um, and thank uh, very much, big thanks to, uh, to Wonka for their assistance with this. Um, I know, do notice Anna's back, so did you want to make any uh, remarks, Anna, before we hand back to Donald? I don't see her. I'm not sure she is online, actually. I can, I can yeah, see her. Donald, uh, Donald we'll, well, let's hand over to Donald for his closing yes. remarks. Okay. Thanks, Donald. Thanks, I mean, Donald. Thank you, everybody, the panellists and all those who have joined us. Indeed, you know, a <clears throat> very uh, important subject that we 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 <clears throat> dwelled upon tonight and we learned a lot and i agree that we will have opportunities in in the group the google groups and all that now before i say more just want to advertise next sunday we'll be talking about quality and safety uh, the time is slightly different it's three hours later than tonight and next slide please the aim of the webinar is to identify quality and patient safety issues to improve primary care delivery during the COVID-19 crisis. And it will cover a range of topics, which includes team organization, safe use of medications, telemedicine, community support and public health issues, giving support to health professions and quality management. So please tune in and, and join us again next Sunday. Next, please. So just want to say thank you again. And I, I think you've confirmed the role of family doctors and all and members of the primary health team, our nurses, uh, working together that we are the approachable provider of comprehensive and replaceable care to rural communities. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And so we will continue this year as never before to deliver health care to our patients in different sometimes innovative ways as shown tonight by many, to meet the demands and restrictions placed on communities for their own safety. As ever, we are the first in and last out professional group, serving our patients as best we can, delivering good quality primary health care. And we will be celebrating World Family Doctors Day in two, time, two days with this theme. So do the best you can for your patients. Next slide, please. You should stand proud of your contribution to tackling this world crisis. Our task now is to bring the best of who we are and what we do to a world that is more complex and more confused than any of us would like it to be. May we all proceed with wisdom and grace. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Donald, and thanks to all the panelists for some really great presentations. Um, the comments and questions will be forwarded to the working party and hopefully they'll be able to reply to at least some of you in slower time. 
So we look forward to you joining us again next week. Um, the, the quality and safety issues will be led by Pilar Astier, the chair of our working party, and we'll be welcoming some more distinguished panelists, including some colleagues from WHO. So we'll see you next week at the more usual time of 1300 UTC. I hope you'll join us then, and thank you to everybody for taking part today. Please stay safe. We'll see you next week.